just so that you know, there'll be a, a time at the end for Q&A with the audience. So if you have any questions as we're going along, feel free to put them into the chat box and then Jesse will get around to answering or putting forward the questions to our, to our speakers. So Jesse, take it over from here. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah, for that very kind introduction. It's very exciting for us and new voices to be working again with Young China Watchers. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar, we are an international collective um, of journalists, um, creators and artists. And our mission is to support the work of self-identified women working with China subjects. But we also welcome the involvement of people of all genders. We have um, a a few very exciting projects, including a directory of nearly 600 female experts on Greater China, uh, which is the popular tool for journalists and event organizers to kind of boost minority representation in media. Um, we have a bi-weekly podcast, which features women and minority voices on China topics. Um, and this is run by, uh, with Sub China News. And we also have an online magazine called New Stories, which um, publishes regular original content from essays to um, reporting and, and photos and I edit that so if you ever have any pitches definitely feel free to reach out to us. Um, it's very exciting for us to be moderating and working on this event today and just to kick us off I guess I'll introduce our very esteemed speakers for today. So the first we have Carolyn Khan who is a Chinese environmental journalist um, based in Beijing and also a fellow member a board member of New Voices with me. She is um, the author of Under Red Skies, uh, her debut book um, that published in 2019 and is the first English language memoir by a Chinese millennial. So definitely go check that out if you if you haven't already. Uh, she was the winner of the 2019 Young China Watch of the Year Award and her work was recognized in 2016 by the International China Journalists Association. And we also have Zong Yu, an 18-year-old climate activist from Beijing. She um, is a student of the University of Michigan who intends to pursue environmental engineering and public policy. Um, despite her very young age, she has been very active in climate change advocacy for the past four years. She's visited Antarctic Peninsula and Svalbard Islands, organizing educational events on environment. And she's also a Chinese youth delegate to, that is, um, to attend the 24th UN Climate Change Conference in Poland. So very exciting. Um, I guess for me, I, I want to kind of give a little backdrop to this event because it comes at such a very interesting time when we talk about China and the environment in particular. So in the past 10 years, I mean, China has made some very remarkable progress when it comes to climate change and environmental protection um, in terms of policy and also uh, it's kind of geopolitical clout uh, internationally and environmental protection has become very important in China and they formulated many uh, policies in recent years to address the issues directly, but because of economic slowdown in China and coronavirus, US-China trade war, and all of these issues happening right now, there's a sense of this kind of declining momentum on climate change and environmental issues, which is really interesting when you when you when when it comes at a time in which the world is kind of looking at China to fill this kind of geopolitical vacuum when it comes to environment and climate change worldwide. Um, and so that's kind of the backdrop to our discussion. And this is also why it's really important to look specifically at gender because uh, we've known from so much research worldwide that climate change has a disproportionately a disproportionately affects different social groups, um, not only along the lines of gender, but also age, um, ethnicity, and, and geographic location and other demographic categories. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a backdrop of what we're discussing today. And so first I'm going to allow um, both Caroline and Zongti to, to make opening remarks and we'll go into a Q&A discussion. So if you have any questions that you think of along the way, feel free to just message into the chat. Um, so I guess we'll just start with Caroline. Do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. First, thank you everyone for uh, joining today's chat and thanks uh, Young China Watchers and New Voice for, for organizing. Um, yeah, because I'm not a scholar, so uh, what I said, but in my work, actually, I'm working as a Chinese journalist. I do meet a lot of Chinese environmentalists and the Chinese families and the activists. Uh, so I think today is more like an opportunity for me to share some of the thoughts and the uh, observations uh, in China. 
Um, I think first thing I hope is not too disappointing is like when we talk about like climate activism and talk about the roles uh, Chinese women and youth play in uh, as the driver to, uh, to the climate activism. I think first we have to admit that the activism in China like is quite different from uh, the activism we uh, talk in the West or any other countries. For example, like I think in China, because of the, uh, the law and the political system, basically right now there's no any space for the like, for example, like in the street activism or protesting, like holding a, a banner slogan. So that is almost like impossible or that would actually bring people a lot of trouble. So that is the first thing when we talk about activism in China. So that requires actually requires a lot of uh, very uh, creative way to work as environmentalists, as feminists in China to the first thing probably you have to work with the government in some ways like either like uh, to uh, collaborating on some kind of events or you have to get approval to do any kinds of events in China. So I think that is a, like a question, like we can later discuss um, how efficient or how, how not efficient that is. Um, but that is the first thing I want to mention. Um, so last year, like during the uh, global uh, uh, climate uh, strike, uh, one of the biggest uh, events um, last September, I was in London. So I post a lot of the uh, pictures I took in the London street and share on my uh, in my like WeChat a moment is like a most mostly commonly used uh, Chinese social media and I do get a lot of uh, uh, questions from the uh, the the young uh, uh, friends or uh, like some family members some family relatives like they are very curious about what is going on and there is the news coverage about the uh, the movement um, but. There is basically no discussion on the mainstream media of like what can Chinese youth or Chinese women or whoever like participate in this like global on the street uh, ac activism uh, activities. Uh, so that is something very interesting. And also something interesting on China's social media is actually the, the, the whole movement, uh, Greta, um, um, well, get inspiration from Greta, uh, actually didn't meet uh, like as positive uh, feedback in Chinese social media as probably like in, in Europe, in London. Um, many people have the, the questions of how efficient the, uh, the, the protest is or how efficient this kind of like, uh, uh, you know, go on the street and uh, like, like, um, like tell the message very directly and uh, very, uh, you know, like ob obvious in this way. Many people question that. So that is another thing. Like, and also many people on social media question like the, uh, the intention of the, uh, the activities because now there's a theory, like very popular theory on Chinese internet about this, you know, probably in any events, like the so-called so like foreign, um, uh, foreign power or foreign, uh, for, foreign countries uh, uh, planned activities. So that got a lot of questions in China. Um, but given what is said, it doesn't mean like uh, climate change is not important in China. Also, it doesn't mean that Chinese society is not participating or reacting to climate change. Um, one example is um, uh, when, when we talk about like a, a female uh, women and climate change, I think it's very important to, to, to notice like uh, women and any other more vulnerable uh, groups in, in China or in other parts of the world are actually getting uh, more uh, negatively affected by climate change. And in China, I think uh, one example is that this year there's a very uh, serious uh, flood in, in southern China. And many, in many of the villages, uh, women, are, especially older women, they stay at the land in the village when the men have more opportunities to like go to the city to work, um, get like work as migrant worker, you owe like any other like social uh, like positions. But women like traditionally, they have the, uh, the kind of like responsibilities to stay, to take care of the, the, the family, the children, and to stay with the land. But on the other hand, women have much less say in say, let's say like to, de to, to decide what kind of project uh, can be done to uh, mitigate the climate change. 
And also women have much less information, for example, to the government uh, like flood method. They much less women use smartphone, for example, they get much less training. And um, like, because women like they, um, because of the gender discrimination, so women have much less to say in the family and the climate change and the natural disaster actually make that worse because women, they already in a much disadvantaged position. And if their income come mainly from the land and the rural China's agriculture sector is mostly affected by the, uh, by the natural disaster. So that become a kind of like a vicious circle. Uh, so yeah, I guess like, uh, I hope today we, uh, I, I think this is a, like a very meaningful uh, platform to, to, to share, to, uh, to maybe discuss what is needed there. Like, because of women, they, uh, they, they have given much less opportunities. So I guess like, uh, maybe there's a way to for the society, for the uh, activism, like to make a, a creative way to get more women participate and to get uh, their voice heard and to provide the information, the services that women really need in when we're facing our global climate change. Yeah, I think that is what I want to share uh, in the beginning. And we can go back to some of the, uh, the things, the issues we later in today's discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline, for that very like great and broad overview of, of, of the topic. Um, let's maybe hand things over to Zhong Xi to get a more kind of uh, personal like climate activism perspective. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Dong Qi Yu. Uh, and in the September, I will be a freshman at University of Michigan studying environmental engineering and public policy. Um, in terms of um, the field of climate change and also environmental issue, like I have, I have a wide range of experiences um, from on-site studies in um, the Antarctic Peninsula um, and uh, the Svalbard Islands, um, and also uh, in Gansu Province, China. I also attended the 24th UN Climate Conference. Um, and like in addition to those activities, I also consistently participate in um, some advocacy work and activism in China, um, including organizing the yearly um, International Youth Summit on Engineering, uh, Energy and Climate Change. So um, yeah, so from my experiences, there are two particular experiences that um, left a really deep impression on me and make me like reflect what I can do as a youth. Um, the first one is my, uh, like my experience in Gansu province, China. Um, like this experience make me to reflect um, how climate change issues um, is interconnected with a lot of other social issues such as gender, um, such as gender issue in China. Um, so uh, like for, uh, for those um, who are not familiar with um, the geography of China, um, Gansu province is in the, nor in, the, in the northwest part of China and is one of the less developed region in China. Um, and, and the major like economy income um, in, in Gansu province is, is majority like is like is agriculture. And, um, and in Gansu people usually plant um, Chinese traditional medicines and also corn. Um, like those, like those agricultural, like those corps are quite um, climate resilient to, in some way. However, because of the like worsening climate in China, um, like according to my conversation with a girl who like who lives there um, during my trip, um, she told me that um, like the the family income has been unstable because the like because because of the influence of climate. Um, and because of that, their family have no choice but to let her drop out of school. And then she has to like work in order to support her family until um, an NGO called Educating Girls in Rural China, like um, finally financed her, like financed her tuition so that she can go back to school. Um, and then according to her, um, like similar situation happens in a lot of home households in Gansu province 
um, es especially in those households in the rural region of Gansu. Um, so like this experience made me to reflect that um, a lot of girls, especially girls, like they're so deeply influenced by um, the worsening climate. Um, while, the, while the boys um, in the households are usually getting, ha like having much more privileges than girls because they are the ones who like get finance to school. Like they're the ones who like getting more care and attention from the family. Yeah, so um, this experience left a really deep impression on me. And, um, and another experience is kind of connected to what um, like Caroline mentioned just now about the way Chinese, um, Chinese youth doing like activism in China. Um, when I, like, dur like during the climate strike last year, um, a journal, a journalist friend approached to me like and asking me, hi Aurora, I, hi Zongqi, I'm at like, I'm at the um, climate strike, like at the location of the climate strike that was supposed, supposedly have a lot of students like, um, like shouting like youth for climate and, and stuff, but there, there's no one here. Can you tell me why? And when I received that message, I was at the test in school. Um, and when I received that, um, like that message, like the first, like the first um, feeling is that um, actually I'm not quite surprised because um, during the September of that climate strike, actually, um, um, actually there's conference, uh, like conferences taking place in Beijing and also, um, and also just like what Caroline mentioned, because of law, because of the policy, because of the political system, um, the way Chinese youth doing activisms are like quite different, like dramatically different from, um, from how the youth in Western world, um, like how they to like make themselves hurt. Um, and um and Greta and her like campaign is um is gradually became more and more widely discussed in China due to um like like due to like the difference in terms of climate activism. Um including me and, and my friends, like we we attribute this difference into like two different reasons. The first one is um like in the Western world, environmental education has been so well developed. Um, a lot of schools, starting from kindergarten um, and like primary school, middle school, teachers will like intentionally to um, like teach knowledge to the students regarding climate change, regarding environmental conservation. Um, however, in contrary, in China, um, environmental education only started a, f a few years ago, like three or four years ago, and it is only uh, like like environmental education is only started in some like in some major cities cities like beijing shanghai so so like the environmental education in china is not as developed as in the western world so it, it makes like chinese youth have like do not have as much um knowledge foundation for them to um like to to confidently discuss. I think a lot of them have the necessary knowledge to discuss those issues, but they, they just do not have the confidence. They are not comfortable like having a in-depth discussion on climate issues with a lot of people. Um, like, and that's because our environmental education has, has not been as developed as in the Western world. Um, and also another, another reason is, um, I think it's the policy system. Um, because in the Western world, in order to spur a change, um, like you, you, you first need to let the government hear you because the whole system is bottom up. You first need to like motivate the voters and then the voters will get the right proposal past the parliament. Um, and finally, it will be enforced into the law or the policy and, it, and such. And during such process, you make a change in the society. However, in, in China, the whole policy system is not the same like in China everything is um, is like from the top to the bottom um, basically is the government that make the ma majority of the decisions and then um, and then you pass you make the law first and then you make correspondingly you create the policies um, uh, and then finally you make the change so so the in terms of system it, it is so different um, so 
I, I also interviewed some of my friends who, um, who are as like who are also a, a re really passionate about environmental issues and and planning to uh, pursue environmental issue uh, environmental studies or environmental science in in the college, um, and what they told me is that um, they give me a feeling that um, chi like the way Chinese youth to develop activism it's more career oriented. Um, they prefer to in instead of go out to the street, they prefer to. Um, to harness their skills and to learn more knowledge. Um, and then like they, they, they normally will plan this in a career way, like how they can um, be, how, how they can be a part, be part of a, a think tank or be in such like um, government department and something like how, how they, like that is how they plan to make changes in the society because of the difference in system. Um, and and I, I think majority of the Chinese youth have the same um, like the same way of thinking. And then and also uh, I also asked some of the like uh, senior members in um, in think tanks in um, in relevant industries in China. And then what they told me is um, China is also like including think tanks and departments of um, different departments of gov the government is like is trying to getting more and more um, like they, they try to um, like uh, like employ students from more and more various backgrounds in the past um, you you get into those think tanks only if you are a, a student graduated from a college in China if you are graduated from a uh, university abroad, you cannot get the opportunity to participate in that level um, or like in, in that kind of decision making. But if you, um, but nowadays, if you are graduate, graduated from university abroad, you still can have like um, the opportunity to um, like to change, make changes in China environmental policies, China environmental, um, law and something you can still join those think tanks and um, government departments like it, it's becoming more and more international and like being more and more um, uh, minded yes um, yeah the, that is just uh, sharing my perspective on um, on the issue Caroline shared um, yeah thank you that's basically it Thank you, Zongqi. That was a really great overview as well. And I'm really happy that you kind of brought up the policy constraints of activism and kind of set this backdrop of how we understand how climate activism from a youth perspective is so different in China compared to uh, in other countries. And I think that leads very well into my first question that I had, which is um, specifically, specifically talking about how you know, there's been studies done on that young people in particular and women in China have, have been more increasingly aware of global climate change issues and also China's place at the center of them. Um, and there, you know, obviously when we talk about Greta Thunberg and kind of that movement um, that you, you mentioned earlier, in July, Howie O, which is, she's a 17 year old climate activist that has been pretty prominent um, voice in mainstream media. She participated in like Greta Thunberg inspired Fridays for Future climate strikes. Um, she told the Guardian that authorities kind of asked her to stop climate activism as a condition for, you know, restarting her studies um, in university. And so it's interesting that there is this type of narrowing space in activism at the same time, but also like more momentum from from youth and from women on on climate striking and interest in 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 being part of policy. I really wanted to ask you about um, when you kind of talk about these different types of activism, how a lot of young people in China, you know, are are going the more policy and a career oriented way of activism. But of course, like as we understand in China, like public pressure is very important, and one of the main challenges is kind of getting normal people to kind of understand climate change and like how it affects them, because people in China tend to think of environment and China as this kind of like policy geopolitical argument and not really like something that you know individual people in society and that consumers you know really it's not the same relationship as as, as western societies i guess have on on climate change issues um i want to ask about you know obviously when you have climate striking and, and people like how we are like having those types of activities that's very prominent in in in, in mainstream media and that's one type of activism and the other ones you mentioned how do you as an activist kind of balance these different types of, of ways of of 
like bringing attention to the issue in terms of the policy level, the grassroots level. And also the second question is kind of like, what is the role of young people? Like why are young people in China kind of at the helm of these discussions compared to previous generations and what you see as the future of kind of your place as a youth as well in this discussion? Um, so for the first question, um, uh, I, I, will, I will use um, the conference I've been organizing, International Youth Climate, uh, International Youth Summit on uh, Energy and Climate Change as an example. Um, like when we are organizing, um, like this is an annual um, conference and each year we hope to motivate more and more people. Um, and the way we achieve this is through, um, you know, celebrity effect, which is like to some extent really um, effective. Um, we would invite some, um, instead of young idols, um, we, we usually um, invite some celebrities who are famous for, um, for instance, um, debating. And also like there, um, there's a, there's a um, show in China, just um, like, it is about like debate and it usually brings different social issues onto that show. So we, we, we invited celebrities from that show um, and to use their celebrity effect to, to, uh, to bring the um, topics forward to more and more um, youth, especially youth people. Um, and also in, in order to make the conference like uh, more career oriented, we invite professors, we invite um, uh, the actual um, the actual delegates in the UN conference, like rep who represents China. And we also invite uh, experts from um, think tanks. Like in this way, we make it um, in the like fun, but also in the meantime, quite career oriented. And students can not only learn about um, like environmental issue alone, but you can also learn about like how things works in different industries. So, so in this way, you like you have a, like you have a like for instance celebrity um, who attracts a lot of attention, and also you have a series of different speakers who can um, who can also teach the participants a lot of um, new information. So like, I think this system works quite well in China, um, um, which balances the um, like like because the celebrity effect, a lot of youth are more willing to post on media like Weibo to discuss such issues. Uh, but in the meantime, it also satisfies their need for a career oriented activism. Um, and also, as you mentioned, um, in China, like uh, there are different voices regarding um, environmental activists. And I, I also want to attribute it to, um, to the, like, the current economy in China because um, in the Western world, the, the poor and the, like, the rich, the ratio is more healthier than in China. Um, in, in, in China, the wealth gap is so, like, is so drastic. Um, the poor are like, way below um, the, like, there's still a lot of people below the poverty line while there are a lot of, um, like, while there's a really small portion of people who like, controls majority of the wealth. So like given the situation in China, it makes like the majority of the people who are just above the poverty line, it makes things so hard for them to think about being sustainable because they're hardly feeding themselves. So yeah, so this is what I observed on Weibo, um, which is a mainstream media in China. Like, like, still struggling above to to be above the poverty line like they they usually they are acting more aggressive on weibo by by saying things such as um we cannot feed ourselves how can you demand us to to like to take care of climate change that is not our responsibility stuff like that so um so i think um like China obviously like have to have a long way to go in terms of like environmental education and also like developing the economy like and and like and reduce the wealth gap and I think that is crucial because um because like you have to feed yourself you cannot just let people starve um yeah so I think when the economy is getting better I think um like more and more people will be more uh, like um more, more willing to take the initiatives um, to uh, like to taking like actual actions um, in environmental like protection and, and other 
um, issues. Um, and for your second question, um, I think the, the, the main difference in youth activist, uh, activities and uh, comparing to um, the grown-ups, I think one of the, like, the major difference is um, youth people are more passionate and more willing to take actual, um, actual changes. Um, like in school, I started an initiative called like um, not to order takeaway in a year challenge. And um, actually it was just me doing this challenge. And, um, and I, I, I found it like quite interesting that later and later more and more of my friends joined me in this challenge. And I think it is a good thing among youth that youth like tends to um, like join others when they're doing for a good cause. So I think that is good. Um, but like when, when I'm, if I'm going to like, like if I'm talking about my grandparents, like um, they know about climate change and they know about environmental issues, but like um, the, the willingness and the consistent consistency of them to taking actions are, I think not as, um, not as like good as the young. So yeah, that, that is only my observation. Yeah. Thank you, Sonsi. Um, so my second question is, is to Caroline, um, shifting back to our discussion on kind of um, looking at the response of, of Chinese society, which you mentioned to climate activists, um, and particularly Greta Thunberg, which I want to mention. I think it's very interesting how um, when Greta kind of was kind of introduced in, in the world, she became this very like beloved symbol and of course immediately had backlash from, you know, Trump and other kind of like, you know, uh, like powerful male figures worldwide. And this is her, the response to Greta has been very um, serious and mostly negative in, in China where there's a lot of associations of, of Greta as kind of a symbol of liberal Western agenda, um, which is tied to like the type of abuse that has been in these discussions, which I know Caroline, you've written about previously as well. And of course these dynamics, it's interesting because it's kind of the intersection between the way we look at environment and the way we look at uh, gender as well. And also the way we have, we look at kind of youth in, in China. And there's a sense of course in, in Chinese society, like that we've talked about how young people should be like focusing on their studies and they, you know, they shouldn't be, uh, you know, like engaged in activism, right? And also like this idea of like, um, well, what is the use of even in, in engaging in activism? And Greta is seen as the embodiment of all of these things and the abuse that she suffers in many ways is, is tied up with nationalism, like anti-feminism and also this um, lack of understanding on climate change uh, from, from Chinese society um, level. And so I was hoping you could shed some light on these dynamics from your experience of reporting, uh, maybe talking to people, but also like talking to people on the ground, but also maybe your, the analysis that you've kind of written about in the past. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. So uh, actually, yeah, you, you mentioned like the Trump supporters and many people in the West, the reason uh, they are against the climate uh, activism and the reason why Chinese netizens, like this is hard to tell who are they actually behind the computer screen, but like from their uh, uh, online comments, I think their reasons, the reasons given are very different. I mean, in China is more about they stress the uh, China as a developing country should prioritize uh, economic development. So that is the mainstream voice on Chinese internet when they are against the, uh, the protests in the West. Um, but if you ask uh, the common, the ordinary Chinese people, do they believe in climate change and do they support uh, countries take actions against the climate change? Probably the majority will say, yes, they, they believe in climate change and they support like measures be taken. But I think one important issue here is like uh, Chinese government and the education in China on climate change is more about sometimes a bit like shallow because when people think about climate change, think about the air pollution, think about the river pollution, instead of like an island uh, in far away from China being uh, submerged in some years. So that is not the first thing people in China think about climate change. So if you ask them, do they care, do they care about climate change? Yeah, they do. They care about environmental protection, but not necessarily everyone agree with that China as a country taking the so-called sacrifice in order to protect some country far away from China 
being uh, flooded by the, uh, the the rising sea 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 level. So this is also a clear message in the uh, the China's uh, national uh, actions. Uh, like um, China, domestic China is reducing the coal power plants, for example. Like, oh, the message is very clear that China will uh, reduce carbon emission, but China at the same time is also building many coal power plants in other countries. So the, uh, the, the two actions actually serve the same goal. It's more like an environmental, uh, you also mentioned environmental nationalism in a way. So both are serving the purpose of benefiting China. China should have the clean air, the clean water, but like outside of China, to many people that is not what they care, at least at the moment. Mm. And also I think that is a, a dangerous message here is uh, okay in the short term, in the past few years, we see a lot of achievement from like China's action in uh, uh, combating uh, uh, pollution. And you could tell, you could see all the data, the statistic, very beautiful statistic. Um, but to me, that is more like the, uh, the, the low hanging fruits that is very easy to achieve in the short term. But I think in the long term, still the country need uh, public participation and the rising, general rising awareness instead of the, the elite um, like society uh, class to participate in this mission. You need everyone to think that they have a stake in this, uh, in, 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 in climate change and they should react in some ways. Yeah, I think this kind of cogniz cognitive dissonance in a way that you mentioned is, 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 very, is very troubling in China and very interesting as well. And actually, Caroline wrote a story that, I read a story that you wrote last year and you, you, know, you mentioned in that story about how basically that, it, maybe there's not that aware, that much awareness of this in China and, and worldwide, mm -hmm. but that, you know, moving forward, climate change will actually have very serious ramifications on China um, in terms of just looking at, um, I think you wrote that by 2050, that most of the many coastal regions um, will be flooded and that, you know, perhaps about 100 million people will be affected and displaced. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's interesting, um, this has definitely been picked up and, and talked about in kind of more like environment and, and gender circles where uh, earlier this year there was a, a paper published by Yuan Zhou and Xiao Yan Sun, two scholars about gender gender sensitivity and climate change policy in China. Mm -hmm. And they talk about how um, basically in natural disasters, food and water shortages, climate migration issues, you know, women suffer disproportionately and that they argue that it's uh, despite the fact that gender and the environment is officially recognized as part of China's like gender equality policy, the integration level is, is, is relatively low and that it's actually easier to kind of try to include climate change in gender policies in China than to include gender in mm. climate change policies and that, you know, the integration of the two is, is just not robust at all. And I, I was just wondering kind of what you think about um, moving forward the kind of potential for like policy level awareness of, of how these issues issues will affect China and also like what kind of what, what we should be looking forward to and kind of like things that we should be paying attention to or, or trends that you see already happening right now along these lines. Um, that's a very interesting paper you just mentioned. Um, I th actually I read something uh, not, not long ago say by a UN uh, women. Uh, so according to their survey, uh, uh, from Chinese officials and Chinese uh, village uh, women, uh, like neither group, the two groups of people, they think women uh, face more like negative impact from climate change. And if you ask them like why, probably people will give you a reason that women in China and the men in China probably enjoy the same right, probably like, uh, like they don't see themselves as victims. And also, um, but I think this is, doesn't mean that they are not victim because like, like in many issues in China, I think the uh, fundamental thing when we talk about like gender inequality uh, facing climate change in China, we have to go back to like gender inequality in China, like on, in the law, in on the paper, like women and men enjoy the same right, but in reali reality that is not true that is not uh, like accurate at least that is not ac accurate for example like men chinese men and and women uh, according to the law they sh enjoy the, the same right to inherit to uh, have the same right to to the land 
But in reality, if you go to the rural China, and it's very rare that any Chinese village woman actually own any land because the land is owned collectively by the village. And if your daughter of the family you marry, you are considered to marry out and you don't have the right to, to get anything from your, your, your family, like in terms of land and house. So that is just one example of the, the gap between uh, the word on paper and in reality. It doesn't mean like this is all the government's fault or the, uh, the party's fault, no. Actually the government and the party are trying very hard to like implement those uh, like gender equality, uh, uh, like the message to promote the gender equality. But a lot of things are also like according to tradition, according to social norm, and women face uh, the pressure of marriage. Women uh, also face this, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that they have to uh, like act in certain ways in terms of social role. Like they are less confident in like taking, like expressing their opinions, but like, as I said, women, Chinese women, probably today are the more, are more like uh, employed to the agriculture sector than men. But almost all the like village decisions are still made by men. So when they're making the decisions, they like very seldom they could really hear what women really need when facing like natural disaster, facing flood, drought, and facing uh, you know, like the, the, the enough and the necessary services. So I think um, in talking about solutions, I, I guess I don't know, but like the government is also trying to like empower women, but I think the process is really slow. So that is why personally, I, I hope there will be more and more like uh, uh, grassroots organizations who really have the power and the, uh, the ability, the willingness to um, how to say like to to say this uh, directly to do things active act things more directly and to like push forward those uh, agendas because like what i the, the example I just mentioned in the beginning like if you ask them do you think you are more vulnerable but well, people will tell you they are not more vulnerable but there are people who could probably will see this like a hidden inequality and i think we need those people and those group to help people to uh, to fill the gap uh, of the gender inequality. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. I, I will, um, before I go into my next question, I want to remind everyone that, you know, feel free to, you know, send questions into the chat if, if, if you have any um, before we kind of will try to squeeze in some questions in the last 10 minutes. Um, and, and if you want to as well, you can you can say your affiliation and, and um, yeah. But anyway, moving on. Um, it's, I really, I'm really interested in kind of hearing, Caroline, what you were talking about in terms of the policy level and, you know, what, what, what is needed in terms of both from the government level, but also from the grassroots and how that is a space in which it has this unique opportunity to kind of um, reach and talk about uh, climate change issues in the ways that is, is, is needed if we're going to have more momentum moving forward. And I want to ask Jones here about this. Um, as someone who is in that space, you know, you're, you're kind of straddling both worlds as in the grassroots circles and using, you know, Weibo, WeChat, social media to kind of um, advocate for, for these changes. What do you think are at the moment uh, for you as an activist, the most kind of important policy initiatives, most like important policy goals that, you know, people in your space is advocating for at the moment. And also maybe could you share some resources, um, you know, for people to kind of understand this and or recommendations for like groups to kind of look at? Um, so like, um, your question is to ask me to share some, um, like the, the most important goal for policies, right? Yeah, so as an activist at the moment, what do you see as kind of the most crucial things that, that youth activists are kind of advocating for and how you're doing this and some resources that you could share to kind of see what, you know, if we want to kind of understand that more? Yeah, sure. Um, like, as, as you mentioned, mainstream media, um, and I think as a young activist, um, the, the thing I really want to see like in terms of grassroots level is um, like is a free flow of information. Like like um, I would take Weibo as an example. Like um, Weibo is the like the largest platform in China. Like a lot of youth people, um, they um, they post 
um, like they post uh, posts on Weibo and they communicate with people on Weibo. Um, Weibo is basically like the Chinese version of Twitter. However, like Weibo is basically um, controlled by a lot of entertainment companies, which a lot of um, like in Weibo, there's a like there's a search trend, you know. Um, and a lot of results of the search trend, like a lot of entertainment companies, they purchase those trends and and like advertise their own like young like advertise their like young idols and something. So, um, in the past, that search trend have some like uh, have a lot of contents regarding social issues and um, like news or something. But later and like especially recent years. Um, the the entire search trend is all about um, it's all about young idols and 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 stuff. So, as a as a grassroots, this posts and like an obstacle that there are some issues being trendy on like on the internet. A lot of young people are discussing about it. However, what you actually see in your Weibo page is actually how like are all about entertainment and um and celebrities. So like. I think the free flow of information is what I think is like getting the ideas, getting the questions like across the internet. I think that's crucial for it. Um, and um, in terms of resources, I would recommend is that um, in China, actually, there's a lot of like, I think WeChat public accounts are, um, are a really are really useful platforms for Chinese youth to um, access inf information. Um, because nowadays WeChat has been um, extremely popular in in China, uh, like there has been like billions of users of WeChat, um, and uh, WeChat public accounts actually usually can be founded by persons and can also founded by companies can also um, founded by different um, organizations and then on those WeChat public accounts they can post. Um, articles they can post podcasts so like it's a like it's, it's a really broad like information so source that chinese youth can actually access to um and usually they're not only knowledge or like articles uh, thesis on it but also there are a lot more opportunities for instance like um environmental activisms um opportunities to volunteer um, like for uh, opportunities to join different communities. For instance, if you're um, doing zero waste, you can join a, a community like that in your in your home country, uh, home like in your in your home like city. Uh, if you're interested in vegan vegan lifestyle, you can also join other like communities like that through WeChat um, a public accounts. So so I think WeChat is actually. Um, a lot of WeChat public accounts are, are great sources for Chinese youth to access information and spur changes among a, a certain targeted um, group of people. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a question um, from Emma. Uh, perhaps maybe we can go with Caroline first and then don't see with this, but how effective do you think the government's recent environmental policies have been? Oh, Caroline, I think you're muted at the moment. Okay. Yeah, if we look at the, uh, what the Chinese government have done in the past few years in terms of, uh, in terms of environmental protection, I think it is very effective and efficient. But I think the question is, when the Chinese government is determined to do anything, it can be done like, like a magic, magically done in a very short uh, period of time. Like what we can see, probably in, during any big important meetings in Beijing, the sky will just magically get so, so, so blue. But it's true that recently, this year, I, everyone noticed that the sky in Beijing is actually getting better. Um, well, the virus is one reason, but yeah, generally it's getting better. Um, but I guess the question here is also like, how sustainable that policy is? how sustainable this kind of uh, effect is like that's that's why earlier i mentioned like i hope there will be more like uh down to up uh, organic voices from chinese society who they say we now we really need to everyone need to take action to maintain the result to maintain the good fruits instead of just like a few uh, government officials they 
like giving the local government the pressure or the industry people pressure to clean the air, clean the water, instead of like mobilizing the people to actually say we need it, we want it, and we want to act to get what we need. And another thing is, uh, I think it's important to notice the, um, again, the inequality here. For example, when, especially few, not long ago, like in the winter of 2017 or 18, uh, 2017, I think, um, when Beijing was so determined to clean the air and China launched the, uh, the, the, the call to gas and electricity campaign in the winter heating in, in the rural China. So because the government wants to achieve that goal in a very short time, so many rural families then end up, ended up like suffering from the coldness in winter, like under zero negative degree in the winter and the school students in the, in the classroom, they couldn't like really have their class because their schools are ordered to take down all the coal uh, heated, um, uh, the heating system. So that is another thing, like when there is the government goal, the, uh, the target, and the government is so determined to do that, when the civil society, when the uh, people lack of their voice, there could be the counterpart effect. Maybe in the long term, it, is, it will go back to the right track, but at least some people sacrifice in certain time, in a certain period of time. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. And maybe Zhong Qi as well can answer how you think about the government's recent environmental policies. Yeah. Um, like I, I, w I would like to approach to this question from two different um, perspectives. Um, so the first one is, um, if I'm going to evaluate whether it's effective, I would say um, generally the policy, individual policies are, um, for instance, the water pollution um, like policies and uh, the air pollution policies, I think those are um, relatively well developed because those has been practices for um, a decade or more um, till now. But um, like not long ago, like a month ago, I, I, I did an internship as um, at a law firm. And then I did some research into the law and po environmental policy in China. And um, an impression I got is that I feel like the top level design of those policies are not, um, are not very clear. Um, like top level designs means, um, for, in for example, if you have a, a water um, if you have a water pollution um, pollution policy and you also have a, for instance um, another another local policy and you have another policies when you when you look at those policies regarding waters together you will you will find out uh, there are some sections of those policies are um, somehow contradicting or not not aligned in consensus like for, um, like between those different policies in China. So, so I feel like um, generally they are quite effective, but if you put a lot of different policies together, you will find out there are still gray areas. There are still um, like, there are still questions, problems between those policies that need to be fixed. Um, so like in, in this, like from this perspective, I would say it's, it's not good enough, but um, like, uh, we, we, after all, we have a, a relatively developed um, environmental policy. Um, another, another way I would approach it is like, just as Caroline mentioned before, um, when a lot of like local, um, like local agencies, when they're trying to um, like put those policies into practice, um, a lot of problems emerge, just like um, they cutting the, the coal um, heating um, like in, in, in the like um, in the suburb area in just in order to have a better air quality like when, when they're trying to like put those policies into practice I think a lot of local agencies need to think twice about like the interconnectedness between a single policy and the livelihood of people like yeah yeah that's yeah that's how I would answer this question. Thank you so much, both Caroline and Zongxi, for these really 
um, interesting perspectives. And I really hope that, you know, this event is just kind of a, a starting point for us to have more of these similar discussions, being able to talk about this. And especially um, for those of you who aren't familiar, New Voices, we have communities and chapters across the world. And, you know, definitely keep in touch with us and, and be connected with us because we are really interested in, in doing more, more work and have similar conversations along these veins. Um, just to let everyone know, we've kind of in the chat group started kind of putting some resources for everyone. Um, so the study that I mentioned about gender sensitivity and um, a recommendation from Caroline. And also, um, I also want to plug that for New Voices, we, we recently launched our Patreon platform. And it would be, you know, really amazing if you would consider supporting our work for as little just as like one US dollars. I mean, we have a lot of projects and all of us are volunteers and you know we really want to be able to kind of give you and bring you the best content and speakers and be part of um you know events like like today and you know for benefits include kind of um different things like a custom newsletter and access to our online chat community um free books um shout outs on our podcasts and even one-on-one -on -one career development sessions um so definitely do do um keep in touch and and give us a shout as well and um thank you so much for everyone for tuning in today and also to young china watchers for collaborating with us on this event um maybe sarah you might want to say a few closing remarks as well Thanks so much, Jesse, and thanks, Songchi and Caroline, for taking the time to share your perspectives. I, I think it's um, in a lot of the events that Young China Watchers do, we um, focus on being able to get these perspectives from people very much on the ground, but also people looking at it from different perspectives, whether that's through journalism or whether that's uh, through community organization. And I think the, the conversation today has really highlighted how it is so important to have those different perspectives, to have the perspective looking at the policy discussing that in, in light of the perspective of what's going on at grass, grassroots level and how those intertwine together. So thanks so much to, to all of you for sharing your thoughts. And thank you to everybody who joined. And if you are interested in staying in touch more with what we're doing as a community around climate change, then please do feel free to subscribe to Young China Watchers newsletter. Hopefully this is just the beginning of um, the conversations that us and New Voices are doing together around this topic. So thanks very much, everybody. and Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.